Welcome to the Forbes Files. Today I'm very excited for our conversation. Joining to me, me today is Joe Jebbia, who is the co-founder of Airbnb. He is also the chairman of Airbnb.org, the nonprofit arm of the organization dedicated to offering resources and housing in times of crisis. Today, we're going to hear more about Joe's leadership and, and what Airbnb has been doing in Ukraine. Uh, since the beginning of the war, they were at the forefront of how so many companies and businesses in the, around the world really stepped up to uh, support Ukrainians during the time, the time of crisis. We'll also hear his perspectives on what it means to be a change maker today, how businesses can more effectively leverage their resources and their mission as positive forces for good in the world. And he'll also share some uh, powerful advice for aspiring entrepreneurs given the incredible journey that he has been on uh, with Airbnb. And of course, with all the entrepreneurial ventures, uh, he, he was a part of show on. Sometimes this is always a little bit tricky. Let's see. Hey, hey. I got you. This is, I, I have to say, this is always like um, one of the, the trickiest parts of Instagram Live is actually getting to see the, the person on the other side. So I, I feel like, I feel like an <laughs> arty victory at this point. Um, oh, it's great to see you. you know, How are you doing together. today? I am good, thanks. Well, thanks so much for, for joining us. I mean, it, the work that you've been doing with Airbnb.org um, has never been more timely, whether that be the work, um, for example, that you did um, with first frontline responders during COVID, uh, leveraging your platform and housing in support of, of, of those incredible uh, workers, but also now most recently in Ukraine. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing, but also the, the mindset and, and, and insight in the organization around how you think about using the platform Absolutely. in this I mean, way. Uh, so many lives have been devastated in Ukraine in just the last couple of months. And as we think about uh, how we can respond as a company, uh, well, first of all, we believe that companies do have a responsibility to respond in the first place, uh, that companies have a responsibility to participate in what's going on in society around them uh, and, and to make societies better. And so, you know, as we saw the, the tragic events unfold uh, starting back in February, it became clear pretty early on that this was going to be one of the largest humanitarian crises in Europe since World War II. And certainly that has played true today. There's over 5 million people displaced and, and fleeing from Ukraine, uh, spreading out through Europe. And so we asked ourselves, how can we help? And uh, the answer was through Airbnb.org which is a platform that allows people, our hosts, uh, and anyone with a home to offer to somebody in a time of crisis. And platform actually is a history that goes back to a host in New York City when Hurricane Sandy struck in 2012. A host named Shell reached out to us and said, Dear Airbnb, how can I volunteer my empty guest rooms for free to those displaced by the hurricane? And it really inspired us to think more deeply about our service. What if we took the same matching technology that we use to help people find a great vacation destination and we repurpose that to help people find shelter in times of need and to match a guest with a, a generous host? And certainly from those early days in uh, New York and Hurricane Sandy, uh, we've been able to house 100,000 people uh, after wildfires in Canada and Malibu to um, uh, earthquakes and typhoons in, a in Asia uh, it's been incredibly rewarding to see how the Airbnb host community steps up to help out. I, I'd be interested because obviously when you started Airbnb, you, the intent um, or you never could have envisioned necessarily that in building one of the, building the world's largest um, accommodations platform, um, the company that you did, that it also could be this extraordinary humanitarian platform. But nonetheless, you still designed it in a way where you were building really powerful connections and powerful connections that could be activated in, in a time of need. Can you talk about how you thought about and designed the company in a way that, that created this opportunity for you all to step <laughs> up in so many situations? I, you know, I wish I could say years? it was intentional, um, uh, but I think, Going back to the early days of the company, there's a, a famous email between Brian, Nate, and myself, my co-founders, about 
wanting to, to build some element of social good into our platform from the very beginning. And I remember we all got excited about the idea. It was August, 2008. We're sitting around our table in our living room, which is our makeshift office. It's just the three of us. And we have to launch our website. And we stack ranked all the things that had to happen to launch our company. And, and this social good part was at the very bottom. And so it was an idea that's been around for a while. And we finally got to circle back to it when we launched Airbnb.org. Uh, and I guess what I have to say is what I've seen over 14 years of being with Airbnb since the beginning is that this idea of hospitality is not specific to a certain location. It's, it, the idea of taking somebody in is actually a global concept and it goes back millennia. Uh, I've become an informal student of this topic and if you study different cultures, the idea of hospitality and taking in strangers goes back thousands of years. Uh, in Greek culture, there was a Greek goddess named Xenia which informed residents to take in a stranger and provide a meal. Uh, in India, there was a phrase, Atiti Devo Baha, which means the guest is God. And if someone knocked on your door and you knew them, you were to treat them like a prophet. If they knocked on your door and you didn't know them, you were to treat them like a God. And I could go on, every country has some code of ethic of how to treat the other. Uh, and so I feel like, you know, through Airbnb, we've we've enabled something that's been a long part of human history. We've done it through the internet and a trusted platform. And I think when you see people step up in times of need to offer their homes, offer shelter, a safe place to stay, uh, it's really just tapping into something that's been innately part of, of humans since the, the earliest days. If you couldn't have obviously predicted the, the use case of, of Airbnb and in terms of humanitarian efforts, obviously in the early days, you nonetheless were very conscious around social good being, um, you know, a uh, part of the DNA of the company as, as you grew and the like. As you look at the past two years in particular, going from COVID to how quickly you, you deployed resources, how quickly your community, more importantly, really activated and looked to you all to, to, to help channel their passion to, to be a force for good. What has surprised you in that process? And what's been the biggest lesson you've learned as a leader? Oh, there's in there's been a plenty. Uh, one that stands out is I think going forward, companies will be required in different ways uh, to be forces of good for society. And those forces that, that change may come from a couple of different areas, maybe from founders who deeply care about this, maybe from employees who work at their companies and demand it. Uh, maybe from the communities that companies operate within. And lastly, maybe from governments that, that regulate and, and require it. Um, so I do think that at this time in business history, going forward, companies will need to prove how they're also good for society besides just turning a great profit. Uh, consumers are demanding it, employees are demanding it, et cetera. Um, so I do think we are at, at some inflection point of how to think about companies operating in the world today. Uh, you know, there's uh, the famous quote from Milton Friedman, the economist in the 1970s, that said the social purpose of a company is to maximize shareholder profit. And I think that probably worked for a, a while, but I think it's probably time to update that quote because shareholders are just one of many stakeholders that companies interact with, their employees, their investors, their consumers, and the cities and states and countries that they operate within. And so at Airbnb, we take a stakeholder approach, which is investors are one of many, our guests, our hosts, our employees, our investors, and the communities that we serve in. So thinking through that lens, I think, you know, companies more and more are starting to think more broadly about who, who they're serving beyond their shareholders. You, you have talked so much in a very powerful way. Um, you know, you, you sit with some of the world's most powerful CEOs, business leaders, uh, policy leaders, and, and the like, um, people who really have the opportunity to activate change. You also have the people, the, the, the community on your platform who have these extraordinary opportunities to, to activate change. But when you're sitting with, um, you know, leaders at the, at the helm of organizations that do have the power to deploy resources very, very quickly, what questions do they need to be asking of themselves um, and within their organization to really in infuse that sense of purpose or catalyze action 
with mm -hmm. a speed and authenticity that's really important in terms of, of creating the impact. Well, anyone in these can. companies already knows the, the, the main answer to that question, which is what's their superpower? <laughs> Ours is that we have this community platform of, of homes and hosts all over the world that we can deploy very quickly in times of need. Nike will have a different answer to that question. Apple will have a different answer to that question. Tesla will have a different answer to that question. But um, every company has some sort of core competency and a differentiator that they can, ex they, I can imagine they, you know, with a little creative thinking could extend uh, to answer the question, in a time of need, how can we help? And so whatever that core competency is, find the Venn diagram of what they're good at with where people need help the most. What, what's, if, if you just talked about Airbnb's superpower, what's, <laughs> what's your superpower um, as an entrepreneur and a, and a leader and someone now who has really immersed themselves um, in, in the philanthropic world I, I would say having well. superpowers. <laughs> what I do love, though, is design. And I love thinking deeply about user experience. Um, uh, in my mind, design is uh, a vessel or a medium to build trust with a customer or a consumer. And so... The more you invest in design, the more trust that you can build with whoever it is you're trying to serve, in our case, hosts and guests. Uh, so I'm, I'm deeply invested in uh, providing and making sure that Airbnb delivers you know, a very seamless design that um, is easy to use, it's intuitive. And uh, I'm reminded of a story in the early days when we're all sitting around a table in our living room. The company was about eight people big. And one of our engineers gets a phone call. And since we're all at the same table, we overhear his call. And it goes something like this. Hey, mom. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. Uh, go to the top right. Yep. Click on that. Yep. Go down to the menu. Nope. Go back. And he's trying to help his mom navigate our own website. And we listen to this, you know, tragic conversation where we think we're designing the best website on the, on the planet. His mom can't figure it out. When he got off the phone, we all debriefed and we said, we have a long way to go. We have to make our site, we said, mom friendly. You know, designed well enough that our moms could figure it out without having to call us to use our own website. And so um, we've really spent a lot of time constantly trying to make something that is easy to use and easy to understand um, that lowers the bar to entry and lowers the friction for somebody to either become a host on our platform and earn a lot of money or somebody to become a guest on our platform and save money when they travel. You mentioned that the design is this this opportunity or this conduit to build trust. If if you know, trust is paramount paramount in in terms of whatever type of relationship um, we have, whether it be in the business arena or our personal lives, can you take that one step further around how people can think about design differently, not just creating great user experience, but what it means in terms of? I think trust? if you want to zoom into it one level deeper, um, you can look at the term design thinking which has been very popularized over the last, I'd say, decade plus, uh, especially in Silicon Valley. And, you know, I think design thinking, actually, it, it's a, a shortcut for what it actually represents, which is understanding the people that you're designing for. That's all design thinking is. It's taking the time to go out into the world and deeply understand with a, you know, heightened sense of empathy, who are we making this product for? Who are we creating Who's this company serving? I think far too often uh, entrepreneurs, startup founders uh, will, you know, kind of get in a, a tunnel zone and kind of create something that is separate from the market that they're trying to actually serve. And, and we, we fell into that trap in the early days. <laughs> uh, and it, it wasn't until a mentor of ours, Paul Graham from Y Combinator, gave us the best piece of advice that we ever got. He said, go meet your people. And as a tech company, as a tech startup, it's a little bit antithetical to the Silicon Valley formula, which is you code your way through problems, you code your way to scale, and you don't do anything that doesn't scale because that's not the way that successful companies were formed. But it's actually quite the contrary. If you look under the hood, the best way to actually even get to scale in the first place uh, is to do things that don't scale. And so Paul's advice to us was to go to our market, which at the time, New York City, we had about 40 hosts, believe it or not, 40 people signed up to host. And we went and met every one of them. And in talking to them, Moira, we learned exactly what was wrong with our product. 
people would tell us all the deficiencies, all the features that were missing. And we took that input. It came back to San Francisco, to our apartment, and that living room table. And we started to iterate and actually make changes based on direct observations of how people were using our service in the real world. They call that ethnographic research. You go out into the environment of the person that you want to understand, see them on their own laptop. You know, in our case, using a Windows PC with Internet Explorer 6, which we didn't even design for. <laughs> it's causing all kinds of bugs and all kinds of issues for people. Um, but that cycle... But it, but it brings you right, you know, right, right to, to your point earlier, to, right to the, to the needs, the wants, and the problems that you're trying to solve for, for this consumer. How, at this point in your career, if so that's how businesses can, can, can build a greater connection with their, with their customers, you're someone who is an entrepreneur, you're a philanthropist, you are looking at so many different ways in which you can infuse innovation, design, creativity in all fabrics of culture and society. What does that design thinking look like for you in terms of your daily practice, in terms of how you go out into the world to, to better understand how you're, you're guiding yourself um, as across so many different arenas in, in terms uh, the of- The thing you made me think of is when I go out in the world, uh, designers have an affliction, which is that <laughs> we autom automatically see what's wrong and we start thinking about how to make it better. <laughs> It's like a very fundamental design mentality is that you're, you're constantly looking for like, you know, what's a little bit off here. And then you start thinking, well, how could that be better? And, you know, Airbnb started with that mindset of we were going to get evicted from our apartment. We couldn't pay our rent. How do we solve this quickly? Um, it turns out the hotels were sold out in San Francisco for a design conference. And we pulled the airbeds out of the closet and hosted three guests. So even the origins of the company were in this mindset of, Something's off here. How do we make it better? Um, how, do you, how, do, how do you balance that tendency when you're looking out in the world and constantly say, how do I make it better? How do you balance the tendency between making things better, but also not getting trapped by the pursuit <laughs> of perfection? Continue to keep oh, moving man. forward without sort of iterating. All right, we're going deep here. Um, <laughs> yeah, perfectionism is, um, you know, it, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. It's, it's, it can drive uh, it's driven me in my life. Uh, it can drive people to, uh, to keep pushing and keep pushing. At the same time, you have to know when to stop. You have to know when to pause or in our case, when to ship. If you're designing something forever, um, you know, it, it almost doesn't matter. Like you have to ship, you have to put in the hands of the market. You have to put in the hands of the customers uh, to get real world feedback and validation that your idea and your execution of your idea is in fact uh, meeting product market fit. Um, and so I, I go back and forth on this every day. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a challenging topic for me actually because I, I am driven by perfection. And at certain times I have to tell myself this question which somebody taught me once, uh, uh, which was very freeing for me, which was the question, how is this good enough right now? And when I find myself stuck in the trap of perfection, I, I ask myself, how is it good enough right now? And I, I find a way. I say, oh, this is how it's good enough right now. Let's ship it and let's move on. I, I ask them, I'm only asking this question <laughs> for a friend. I mean, I don't know, right. I don't know anyone else would do that. Um, but, but yeah, just for a friend. Um, but, 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 I, but I'm always so, so curious that balance because when you do have such audacious big plans, um, it, it is always this, this balancing act. Um, a couple of other questions for you, Joe. You, know, you all are sort of this, this um, poster child in terms of defying the odds, right? Making the impossible possible in terms of the Airbnb story. Uh, you know, countless rejections. I mean, that rejection seems to be a, 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 an, like a, a main stage character, right? In the early days of Airbnb, in terms of people not seeing the idea, not being into it, being, buying into it. And that was really an invitation for you to keep moving forward. That obviously, that, that drive obviously applies to anything big in the world that you want to do, whether that be in business, business that has a chance to, to obviously have also a, a mm -hmm. powerful impact on the communities you serve, but also in terms of tackling the really big challenging problems that we're, we're facing in the world today. Can you share how you learned to harness that, that muscle of resilience or the questions or the mindset that you mm -hmm. continue to embrace as tackle these really complicated, but 
but important issues well, in the world. Well, I wouldn't say that rejection was a character. I say rejection was many characters in the early days of Airbnb. Uh, we met many faces and forms of rejection along the way. People said, this is crazy. This is stupid. It's, it's weird. No one's ever going to do this at scale. You guys need to go work on something else. You should quit now. Uh, you know, and um, there were, there are a couple of things that kept, kept us going. Uh, the first is that we hosted three guests in our apartment and we knew the experience firsthand. So having that firsthand, you know, uh, experience informed us and we could see a future where other people would enjoy hosting people as much as we did. All these investors and the people that said, no, it's weird and crazy. They didn't have that. And so I think ha like, you know, I would, I always encourage entrepreneurs to, um, you know, don't, don't chase, uh, you know, hot technology, chase, uh, chase a hot problem. Ideally one that's, that you're trying to solve for yourself because you'll, you'll have an insight and a passion for it that, that will be necessary to help you overcome the inevitable rejections that lie ahead. Last question for you, Joe. You have built this, you know, helped build this extraordinary company. You are now focusing so much around um, how you can leverage the company, but other so many other different platforms um, for for the good of the others and to to really um, be a positive force in, in the world around you. What's been the biggest um, lesson you've learned on what it takes to drive change? What it takes to be a change maker when you are facing mm. formidable odds? What comes to mind is uh, another lesson from, from Silicon Valley that, uh, that we experienced, which was this idea of paying it forward. When, we got to San, when I moved to San Francisco in 2006, I couldn't have been more of an outsider. I had no connections. I didn't know anybody. I was like, and it was only through mentorship and, and starting to meet some folks in the startup community that took us under the wing and they said, um, like, you know, everything you're doing is wrong here. Check what, here's another way to think about it. They made introductions for us. And by the way, like they had very busy startups. Like they didn't have any extra time to spend with us in the early days, you know, with three guys trying to make this crazy, you know, house sharing rental websites, stay in people's homes. Um, but, but we later, you know, came to understand that they were just paying it forward. Somebody had helped them when they were starting to make those connections and get the right feedback that they needed. And so um, I think, you know, with Airbnb.org, for example, or with my personal philanthropy, there is this, I, I believe, responsibility to continue to pay it forward. That, you know, if you do make it to a, a certain place, you know, in the business community or, or, or personally, uh, you do have responsibility to give back and to create opportunities for you know, the next generation of entrepreneurs to start the next big, exciting company.